Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. I'm sure all of us were heartbroken when we heard about these youngsters, less than 50 years old, often less than 40 years old, dying of premature heart disease. When we heard about Raj Koshal, Puneet Rajkumar, and Siddharth Shukla, but the truth is heart disease, according to the WHO, is the number one killer of people across the world. And it accounts for about 17.9 million deaths a year. In India alone, we have about 17 and a half lakhs. And remember, India doesn't have a reported all-cause mortality. So what are the risk factors for heart disease? What are the symptoms? How do you treat it? And how do you avoid it? Hey guys, I'm Dr. Nene, a US trained cardiac, thoracic, and vascular surgeon, and a general surgeon. As a healthcare innovator and a health tech innovator, I wanna empower you to your best health ever. On this channel, we will share evidence-based medicine from all of us to you through our experiences and training about health and healthcare. The goal is to help you make informed decisions about your own health as well as that of your loved ones. We're here for you, so don't hesitate to reach out. So the first thing to remember is heart disease is all about supply and demand. And there's these arteries on the outside of the heart which pump blood to the heart muscle. The heart muscle is three different things. It's a muscle which, when constricted, pumps blood from the two upper chambers to the lungs or to the body. And it's also an electrical conduction system. And it's an arterial and venous system that powers up all of the other things. And what happens in heart disease is you get blockages in the main arteries which feed to your heart or in the smaller arteries that feed to your heart. And when they block up and don't have enough flow, that muscle becomes ischemic or has starvation for oxygen. And that results in a heart attack. So let's start. With anyone who has looked at the risk factors for heart disease, they're fairly clear. And some of these are more important than others. Like if you have a first degree relative with heart disease, your risk of heart disease goes up four to tenfold higher than the baseline. Similarly, if you've had a previous heart attack, your risk goes up substantially for having a second heart attack. And in these types of patients, we're talking about primary prevention through different means and different ways to change their risk factors. In addition to these risk factors which we talked about, there's also risk factors smoking, morbid obesity, uh, diabetes, and a host of others which we've listed. As always, I've left the references in the description below so you can always look at the evidence-based material for yourself and decide. Now let's say you have those risk factors. Do you run and hide, put your head in the sand? No. In fact, now you have to think about what you can do to change that. If you're morbidly obese, see a doctor, go on a diet, start an exercise program to make your heart stronger at the same time as reducing weight and being happier. If you have first degree relatives with heart disease, make sure that you go into a doctor and mention that. If, it, if they succumb to it, meaning they passed below the age of 50, the risk is even higher. And interestingly in India, it's a very peculiar type of heart disease in males, where it's one type of uh, lipid vehicle called a triglyceride rich heart disease. And it occurs 10 years younger than the Western counterparts. So if we saw heart disease peaking somewhere between 50 and 65 in the US, it often peaks between 40 and 50 in India. And this has been mentioned in numerous papers uh, where they find this. And when it happens, Asians are often smaller in build and they have smaller arteries and as a result, end up with tighter blockages and worse blood flow. So let's move on now from the risk factors to what are the symptoms of heart disease? In 85% roughly of patients who have heart disease, they may have typical symptoms. And why I'm saying that is you'll figure it out in a second. But those symptoms can be chest pain, chest pressure, shortness of breath, chest pain radiating to the left arm, or back pain. And it can be associated with activity or sometimes at rest. The tricky part is 15% of patients will either have no symptoms or have atypical symptoms, meaning symptoms of heartburn or dyspepsia, which are often construed as something else. And that's particularly to diabetics who often have uh, nervous systems, nerves in particular, which don't function normally. And in those patients, and also in women, we often see the disease presenting late, and hence the mortality or the complications are much higher. So the idea is if you're a diabetic, or 
In the case of women, we found that they often did not go in early. They said, oh, this is just heartburn, or I'm so busy, I have so many things to do, I won't go in. And heart disease in women actually has worse outcomes because they often present later and they often have smaller arteries. So now you've got these symptoms, or maybe atypical symptoms, and they're reproducible and they come on with activity. What do you do? If you're at home and you have chest pain, if you're in the US, you call 911 and you go to the hospital or you drive into the hospital immediately. And why that's important is time is muscle. In the US, we used to count survival and mortality risks by door to balloon time, meaning the time you got into the hospital, but more importantly, from the time you hit the hospital to the time you hit the cath lab and the artery was opened or you went to surgery. And in an ideal setting, 30 to 60 minutes is the best outcomes. If you wait longer than six hours with a heart attack, the risks are much higher. And six to 24 hours is the witching period for heart surgeons operating because you get very bad reperfusion effects often leading to the heart being stunned. Now that's a challenge in India because the truth is that just getting to the hospital with traffic and all that in many places is tough. But moreover, India's not one India. It's 30% metro, 70% rural, and it, where resources in many cases are sparse. And so the idea is to recognize this early and often and move from the acute care mode to prevention, early recognition, early treatment. Prevention of heart disease relies on A, recognizing the risk factors for heart disease and changing them. B, focusing on living a better lifestyle and improving all of your parameters for healthy living. It's not always easy. You can't always change the stress at work. You can't always change your diet. You can't always improve your exercise, particularly in the last two years with the pandemic. Let's face it, not all of us could get outside and do what we needed to do. I'm already feeling better, and I had had my pandemic pounds for a while, and now they're all gone. But I can tell you that you need to overcome that. You need to set the goals in front of you and look at these, go see a doctor, track all of these things. In a later video, we'll talk about different aspects of this with weight loss and exercise and all that on the channel. So you can refer to those to help you with some of that. But heart disease is always about prevention. It's about eating right, watching your weight, exercising. If you have high cholesterol and you have risk factors or you've had an event, that's primary prevention. Let's talk about cholesterol for a second. The original studies done in Framingham, Massachusetts suggested that people with elevated cholesterol were at risk of heart attack at a higher rate. However, more recently, there were some Crestor studies on a particular drug which reduced cholesterol. And over 12 years, they weren't able to show a significant decrease in mortality in most patients. There were exceptions to that in patients who had secondary prevention, meaning they'd already had an event, or patients with exceptionally high risks, family history or other factors, which would push you to using it. But as a rule, we're not paying as much attention to cholesterol now as a primary prevention technique, whereas before that, we were all pushing to bring the cholesterol and the LDL way down. And why that is, is because the benefits did not outweigh the risks in primary prevention in patients with low risk. In patients with high risk or secondary prevention, it makes sense. Let's move on from prevention now to what you do if you're having these symptoms. The first and foremost thing is to call for help. Don't just sit by and watch this consume you because time is muscle as we always said. And the bottom line is the sooner you get in and the sooner someone can get you assessed and evaluated and treated, the better off you're gonna be. In the meanwhile, what can you do? There's numerous studies that suggest just taking a, a baby aspirin alone, 81 milligrams, is beneficial. How it works is to block platelet coagulation or clotting, and it can help with your heart. In the hospital setting, I would give people supplemental oxygen, I would give them nitroglycerin while getting an EKG and doing other things on the way to the cath lab. In addition, in many cases, we would put them on blood thinners through the IV. You can't do that at home, right? Your only hope is to get into the hospital. Now you've been admitted to a hospital, you typically go through the ER, they're gonna do an EKG on you, and they're gonna look at specific changes which would indicate that parts of your heart muscle are having problems with blood flow. And what they'll end up doing is 
temporizing you until they can get a cath lab operating. If perchance your EKG is not showing it but you have symptoms, the other thing they often do is draw cardiac enzymes. What are cardiac enzymes? When your cells die, they basically break down and these cardiac enzymes, which are byproducts of uh, muscle breakdown, will go into the bloodstream and these can be measured. The most common ones are troponins or uh, myocardial enzymes and these things are essential and if your troponins measured at different intervals are positive then it indicates that you have had a cardiac event. That would push you to potentially take someone to the cath lab but there are a lot of criteria. The second thing they may do in the hospital after getting the EKG if they're not sure is getting an echocardiogram to see if one part of your heart muscle is moving differently than another part. And what will happen is if there's an area which is starved for blood, meaning there's a blockage there, that part of the muscle will become either hypokinetic or akinetic. Hypokinetic means move less and akinetic means not move at all. Depending on when you get to it, you can reverse that. If it's within the first six hours, there's a good chance that you can get that back. And if it's within the first 30 minutes, chances are it'll get back completely. Beyond that, sometimes the heart will get stunned and it may take a number of hours or days to get better. So what are the options once you're faced with that? There's actually three options. The first is if you're in a remote area and you're having a massive heart attack, the one thing they can do, and if they're proving it, is they can lice you with TNK, which is something which breaks down the clots. But there are basically things which act on the clots to break them down if they don't have a cath lab. In an ideal setting, a cardiologist would see you, they would take you to a cath lab, and through access through your groin, through the femoral artery, they would, or through your radial artery, they would put a catheter up and squirt some dye in to see what blockages are there, and then they'd pass a wire down and get past the blockage, and then either suck it out or put a stent across it to re restore flow. Now there's situations where you can't do that. And the absolute indications for a bypass surgery would be severe three vessel disease, meaning that the three main arteries on your heart are blocked and you're starving the heart muscle for blood. The second would be a left main, meaning the, the two arteries on the left side of your heart, one going down the front and one going down the side, the LAD and the circumflex, come from one root called the left main off the aorta. And if that's blocked high grade, it's very risky to put a stent across. And so that would be another indication. The third would be multi-vessel disease, meaning small blockages all throughout in arteries which could be bypassed in diabetics. And in all of these three cases, they've shown that there's benefit to operating on someone. Now, they catheterize you, they put in a stent. What can you expect? Usually recovery from stents is fairly quick. There are some complications which can occur, like having bleeding from your groin, you can have pseudoaneurysm or a, a small collection there, or you can have bleeding from other areas from the blood thinners they put you on. They also put you on antiplatelet agents for a number of months. And you will have to tolerate them, and some of the side effects can be from bleeding from your gut, from your stomach, through ulcers and things like that, or from other areas which were not an issue before, but were revealed once they put you on the antiplatelet agent. Now let's say they can't stent you. What are the other options? Depending on how sick you are and how well they can stabilize you with the blood thinners, the oxygen, the nitroglycerin, they can dictate whether you need to go to emergency heart surgery or whether they can let you stabilize a little bit and take you. But generally, if they've opened up the block or bought you some time and you're no longer showing ischemic changes but you have severe heart disease, then the recommendation would be to do it either electively, meaning at, at a small time interval, or emergently, meaning that I need to go right away. And when they take you to the operating room, what they'll end up doing is, under general anesthesia, they'll, they'll take artery from the inside of your chest, veins from your legs, and open your chest up and sew the arteries onto your heart or the vein onto your heart coronaries and then attach that to the aorta in the case of the veins or attach with the artery that comes from the inside of your chest, it already has its own blood supply. With that, the long-term survival is exceptionally good in patients who warrant that. And remember, I gave you those criteria for doing it. So now you've had heart surgery, what do you expect? Generally, you're in the hospital about three to seven days. Afterwards, it will take about three months to get over it, but the recovery will be full in most cases. 
there are risks and your doctor will explain those to you. But the long-term benefit from heart surgery is very clear. The artery which we put on often is open 90% of the time at 10 years and the veins can be as high as 70%. It's a very proven procedure for patients who need it. The hope would be with this and what the take home is, is if we can prevent early recognize and early treat and move away from acute care, we can solve this puzzle. So let's, let's face it, worldwide and in India, there aren't enough resources to go around. And heart disease is such a killer, predominantly because people come in late. And if they understand what the risk factors are, what the symptoms are, what the treatment is, and also when they should go in, right? Then the hope would be that we can treat them earlier in the diseases process. And in doing that, we can potentially save their lives and save the lives of their loved ones. As always, I've left the evidence-based links in the description of this video. And you can go to my website, drnane.com, which has a lot of the details that you can dig deeper on. I'm here for you, and you're here for me, and together we'll build a better world. But the idea is to start the dialogue now. And so leave comments below. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and share. And always, always think of your health because it's something which can slip by very quickly and it's something that if you spend time on, can be amazing. Here's to your health and here's to your happiness. Thanks for joining us.